being 2 p.m. We'll go to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted, Senator I, Wong. I thank the Senate. I thank the Senate. The Leader of the Opposition has announced the appointment of the Hon. Ed Husick MP as Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Resources following Order. the resignation of the Hon. Joel Fitzgibbon MP. I seek leave to table the revised Shadow Ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. I refer to the disturbing report aired by Four Corners last night, which reflected an ongoing culture within the Morrison government of inappropriate and sexist conduct and intimidation. What is the Minister for Women's response? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, at the outset, let me make it very clear that uh, I condemn all inappropriate treatment of people in the workplace. Women and men, including relationships that exploit an imbalance in power within a workplace. Every Australian has the right to feel safe in their place of work. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. A message sent by one member of an internal coalition women's WhatsApp group said, and I quote, we, each of us, inspire young women to aim for leadership. How do we continue to do this in the face of puerile backstabbing from male party members whose sole aim is to count numbers and take our place? Was the minister aware of the existence of this WhatsApp group and has she offered advice to members of this group? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I'm not specifically aware of, uh, of that WhatsApp group. There are many, as I'm sure those opposite uh, also share. Uh, however, I would uh, reiterate what I said uh, in my uh, response to Senator McAllister's first question and indicate that we know well from the Respect at Work inquiry uh, carried out by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins that there are many workplaces in Australia which don't meet the standards that we would hope and expect to see. That includes this parliament, and it doesn't just include the government sides of this parliament. We know that. And so it is for all of us, it is incumbent on all of us, women and men, to address and take responsibility for addressing these issues across the parliament uh, in the uh, ancillary uh, parts of the parliament, whether that is uh, the press gallery for other staff, for the entire building and the entire community in which we work, including the political community, Senator. Uh, it's not acceptable. I condemn all Order. inappropriate Senator treatment Payne, of women, including, as I said, particularly in the workplace. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the minister for her answer. What advice has the Minister for Women given the Prime Minister to improve the culture of his government and ensure Liberal women feel safe and can come to work without fear of intimidation or sexism. Senator Payne. Sure, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator McAllister for her question. Uh, in fact, in 2018, uh, at the direct request of the Prime Minister, um, my political party undertook a comprehensive review of its processes for the handling of complaints and dispute resolution to ensure that our party had rigorous and confidential processes in place, as we should. The review resulted in the development of the Liberal Party's first National Code of Conduct and Complaints and Dispute Resolution Policy, both of which were endorsed unanimously by the Federal Executive of the Liberal Party in 2019. These are matters which we took and which we take very seriously. Many other workplaces do not have similar uh, codes or do not have similar dispute resolution policies. Many other workplaces, for example, uh, and other political organisations have not instituted uh, the restriction on sexual relations that former Prime Minister Turnbull instituted, which was maintained by Prime Minister Morrison. We take this very seriously, Order. and it's Senator a matter Payne. of a time for the answer has expired. Senator Van. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the progress Australia has made containing the outbreak of COVID-19 and how the Australian approach to combating the virus compares internationally, allowing Australia to reopen 
recover and build a stronger nation. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Van for what is an incredibly important uh, question. Mr. President, since March, Australians have taken extraordinary steps uh, to protect the health of their fellow citizen and, of course, our economy from COVID-19. Uh, with Victoria, as Senator Van knows, now coming out of restrictions, uh, we are now at a very important moment, with encouraging signs that we are containing the virus within Australia. Today, I'm pleased to update the Senate that for the first time since February, we have had no new cases of community transmission for three consecutive days. Globally, there have now been over 50 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 1.2 million deaths in total. Sadly, this includes 907 Australians. While any death from COVID-19 is sobering, the hard work of Australians means that when compared with other developed nations with advanced health systems, Australia has performed remarkably well. Over 9.1 million COVID-19 tests have been conducted since January, with 27,674 Australians diagnosed with COVID-19. Of these, Mr President, only 85 cases remain active, with Australia averaging now less than 10 new daily cases over the last week. Globally, new cases have increased by over 565,000 a day over the past seven days. The results have only been possible, though, because of the early actions the Morrison government took on the basis, as we know, of medical advice. We closed Australia's borders, we secured our testing capacity and, importantly, we invested in contact tracing. And together, Australians and our health authorities, Order. we have Senator achieved Cash. these outcomes. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on the progress that the Australian government is making towards securing access to a COVID-19 vaccine? Senator Cash. Uh, and again, thank you, Senator Van. It is an important question. The government has announced two new purchase agreements, Mr. President, for the supply of promising COVID-19 vaccines. While access to these vaccines is subject to clinical trial outcomes on the safety and effectiveness of each candidate and approval by Australia's Therapeutic Goods Administration. A diverse vaccine portfolio is a key component of Australia's COVID-19 vaccine and treatment strategy. The new agreements build on the Australian government's existing commitments to the COVAX facility, the University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the University of Queensland CSL vaccines. To date, the Morrison government has invested more than $3.3 billion across five separate agreements with local and international pharmaceutical companies. While there are no guarantees, this is encouraging news coming out of global vaccine Order, trials over recent days. Senator Van, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. With the welcome news overnight of the promising results being reported of vaccine trials from across the world, how well positioned is Australia to roll out a vaccine and provide enough doses to keep Australians safe? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government's two new production and supply agreements have secured an additional 50 million doses, securing early access to 134 million doses of a COVID-19 vaccine to Australians in 2021-22. Australia and 2020-21. Australians will have access to 33.8 million doses of the Oxford vaccine, 51 million doses of the UQ vaccine, 40 million doses of the Novavax protein subunit vaccine and 10 million doses of the promising Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. All four vaccine candidates are likely to require two doses per person. CSL has confirmed its Australian manufacturing schedule is on track to produce 30 million doses of Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine candidate and subject to regulatory approvals, first doses will be ready for use in Order. early 2021. Senator, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Finance Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
I refer to the minister's comments during your appearance on Sky News on 8 October when you said, and I quote, as finance minister myself, I will be acutely aware that the quality of spending is what matters when it comes to how we invest. Does handing $444 million of public money to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation meet the minister's quality spending standard? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Gallagher for her question uh, and, uh, and the question as, uh, as Minister for Finance. And indeed, uh, those remarks are remarks that, uh, that I stand by in terms of the importance of the quality of spending. And it is crucial across government that we work always to ensure that government spending is targeted where it's necessary to what is necessary. That's been the approach of our side of politics all along. It was that type of approach in terms of making sensible decisions around budget management uh, that enables us, enabled us to create an environment coming into this economic crisis that we face right now uh, that had our budget come back to a point of balance. It was through that careful budget management and that economic management that we ensured that we ensured. Have you looked at the uh, the previous budget outcome, Senator Wong? Have you looked at the previous Order. budget outcome, Senator Wong? It, uh, Order. Now, now, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, in relation to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, this was an important investment made in an important national asset. The Great Barrier Reef. Order on my left. The Great Barrier Reef is a crucial part of our ecology, of our environment, of Order. our tourism industry, and indeed has Order. been central to commitments that we have made to the world Senator in terms Keneally. of the management that we apply to the Great Barrier Reef. And the support for the Great Barrier Reef Foundation is absolutely about making sure that we get investments ongoing over a period of time across the reef, uh, supporting a range of different measures uh, that will support the health, well-being and resilience of the reef through that time. Uh, and though that funding we are seeing already now is being applied in practical ways to support the reef, one of our great and appropriate assets. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 83 per cent of the $3 billion allocated from the Urban Congestion Fund, administered by Minister Tudge, has gone into Liberal seats or seats targeted by the Liberal Party. More than one third went to Liberal seats in Melbourne. Does this $2.49 billion worth of public money meet the Minister's standards of quality spending? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Th thanks, Mr. President. Well, I'm left wondering which projects the Labor Party are, uh, are against. Which projects, Order. in terms of urban infrastructure or congestion, Order. they think are unnecessary, Mr. Order. President? Order. So those, those, Senator Wong. Those, those opposite will criticise endlessly about things that they think aren't being done, Order. about things they think that aren't being done, and yet when indeed the government does decide to invest in the Great Senator Barrier Wong. Reef, or does invest in relation to urban infrastructure and addressing congestion and helping to ensure that families can get home more safely, on time, to increase productivity across our economy by dealing with congestion and those issues, then they come in and they criticise those types of investments. It's what we see from the Labor Party all of the time, of course, is a complete lack of consistency in that Order. regard. Now, we have invested in this relation in terms of supporting Australians, supporting Australians to be able Order. to get Senator the best Birmingham, possible outcomes time in their lives. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Does the minister consider the allocation of 97 per cent of the SME export hubs grants to coalition electorates constitutes quality spending. How can Australians trust you as finance minister to keep your word when the government's own record demonstrates your willingness to spend taxpayers' money in your political interests rather than the national interests? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, I'll, I'll take the interjection from Senator Wong because it is absolutely taxpayers' money. We on this side have always recognised that it is taxpayers' money and that it needs to be handled Carefully. It is why we made sure that we made steps through our early years in government 
to reduce the rate of growth in government spending, to tackle the structural deficits that had been left by the Labor Party, and by care being careful with taxpayers' money, we created the circumstance where absolutely the economy had the resilience to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. We created the set of circumstances where we could invest record sums in supporting Australians through these unprecedented times and in doing so still maintain Australia's AAA credit rating, maintain indeed an economic Order. response that along with the health response is the envy of the world very much, and that is because of careful, consistent economic management over a long period of time that invests Order. in the priorities Senator for Birmingham. Australia. Time for the answers expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The allegations aired on Four Corners last night reveal a culture of sexism, cover-ups, abuse of power and behaviour that could constitute a breach of the ministerial standards. These are not issues of the past, as the Prime Minister characterised them today. This culture continues. This is the Parliament's Me Too moment, and it needs a strong response to ensure that women working in this building feel safe. Will the Prime Minister investigate the behaviour of all his ministers for compliance with the ministerial standards? And will he stand aside Ministers Tudge and Porter while conducting such an investigation? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can I echo? Can I echo Order. very much the words? Order. The words of Senator Payne earlier in relation to the type of workplace that everyone should be able to expect to work in, whether they're working in this parliament, whether they're working across the public service, and whether they're working anywhere across the Australian economy, or indeed whether they're working elsewhere internationally, where Australia advocates for the highest of standards in terms of workplace practices. It is important that we have high standards and that they are adhered to. It's important that we have processes in terms of the way in which complaints can be lodged, dealt with and handled. That's why I would reiterate again uh, that if a parliamentarian or a member of parliament has any concern about a workplace incident, then we do have public processes that are available to all staff in this place, to all members of parliament in this place, available on the Department of Finance website as to how, website as to how they can access support and the process for reporting a complaint. Anybody in this building who feels that they have been bullied or harassed or who are concerned about a workplace incident should contact the Department of Finance, who will provide advice, support and assistance. They will also treat all complaints confidentially and thoroughly, which will be investigated independently of government. Employees in this building can also access the Employee Assistance Program, which is an independent, confidential professional counselling service that can provide staff with assistance in dealing with work and life issues. And these are all appropriate responses that have been built over a number of time that are in place right now and that I would urge all members to make sure uh, their staff and others across this building are aware of. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. That existing complaints process is little known and too weak. You have to complain to your boss or to finance, who then requires mediation with your boss, and finance cannot take any disciplinary action against MPs or MOPS Act employees. Will the Prime Minister put in place a proper framework for reporting and investigating sexual misconduct so that women can come forward and without fear of reprisal? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. Uh, I would urge the Leader of the Greens not to undermine the process that does exist which is independent of government uh, and does enable a confidential complaint to be raised. Uh, it, is, it is important that the Department of Finance uh, maintains those protocols and principles, which they do. Having had the chance in the last couple of days and reason to ask questions about how these processes apply, I don't find out, as the responsible minister, who has made a complaint or who the complaint is against, because the independence is upheld and is of paramount importance through that process. So employees should have confidence in that regard. Now, I would certainly welcome, Senator, if you want to talk to the Department of Finance about their processes, then we'll be happy to facilitate that type of meeting for you 
or anybody else across this building uh, to make sure they have confidence that if there are issues, complaints can be Order. raised Senator and put Birmingham, through the proper Senator process. Water is a final supplementary question. Thanks, uh, President. As Attorney General, uh, Ms. Minister Porter will be responsible for the government's response to the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work sexual harassment inquiry. Does the Prime Minister think Australian women can have confidence that these recommendations will be implemented by Minister Porter? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I'm sure the government will respond to that inquiry in the usual way, which involves consultation across uh, all of the affected areas of government when it comes to uh, such reports and responses to them. Uh, that will include uh, um, consultation uh, with Minister Payne's uh, department uh, and others that are relevant uh, in terms of responding to such inquiries. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investments, Senator Birmingham, and relates to trade with China. South Australian lobsters were among tonnes of lobster left decomposing on the tarmac in China, allegedly due to customs delays. The Chinese government has subsequently used state media to confirm export suspensions on several products key to South Australia's economy, including the highly sought-after Southern Rock Lobster, of which South Australia produces 53 per cent of Australia's 3,000 metric tonnes. Has the minister spoken with the Seafood Trade Advisory Group representing the industry to provide urgent assistance? And if not, why not? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I, my office, and, uh, and agencies have certainly spoken with a number of different seafood industry uh, representative organisations, businesses, uh, or the like, uh, in terms of the, uh, the particular name of the one you've referenced, uh, Senator. I uh, will have to uh, have to just double check in terms of the consultation or engagement we've had there. Uh, there is no doubt that this is, uh, is an industry uh, facing a very stressful and challenging time. Uh, I addressed some of those issues in this place yesterday, as I have publicly on a number of occasions. Uh, we take very seriously the interruption uh, to the timely passage uh, of live seafood through Chinese ports. Uh, the absence of timely passage is obviously threatening uh, to an industry uh, who have uh, time-sensitive, high-value products. Uh, that, uh, that require such timely passage through those customs processes. We don't deny the right of any uh, importing nation to, of course, undertake appropriate quarantine and safety checks. Australia does so, and we respect the right of others to do so. But it needs to be done in a way uh, that doesn't impede the ability of that trade to occur. They are the representations that we continue to make uh, to China in relation to this issue, uh, and we will certainly maintain pressure in terms of our expectations uh, that any such processes or checks applied to any of our products, but in this case the live seafood trade, uh, are undertaken uh, in a manner that doesn't operate uh, as a non-tariff trade barrier uh, and effectively impede the trade as appears to be occurring uh, right now in relation to those products. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, it would be an economic disaster if China also refuses to accept South Australian mine copper our wheat, meat, seafood and our wine. Can the minister advise the Senate of the total value of South Australian exports to China affected by these bans and how many South Australian jobs could be at risk? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I can advise that South Australia's uh, exports to China uh, in 2019-20 uh, were worth uh, approximately $3 billion. Uh, this had been a 12.5 per cent increase uh, on the previous year. Uh, and so, though we are seeing uh, disruption it's occur in a number of individual cases at present, uh, and in certain sectors like barley at a more universal level, it is worth keeping uh, in mind the fact uh, that for the financial year not that long ago concluded, uh, we did still see record volumes of trade facilitated across a number of different uh, product categories. And that doesn't downplay the fact that we take very seriously where we are seeing interventions that we think. Uh, disrupt the free flow of trade, uh, hurt the flow of trade for Australian businesses, uh, and that is why we are raising those concerns uh, continuously uh, with Chinese authorities in terms of seeking, through diplomatic or administrative channels, responses uh, that can provide greater certainty to Order. Australian Senator exporters. Birmingham. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, um, Minister, have you met with your South Australian trade counterpart, Minister Stephen Patterson? or indeed the Premier Stephen Marshall to discuss how these bans will affect South Australian agricultural goods and what they plan to do about it. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Look, I have uh, had discussions with Premier Marshall and, uh, and Minister Patterson in South Australia, as, uh, as I have with uh, some other uh, ministers at a state and territory level around, uh, around the country. Um, uh, they obviously all share the concerns that you have raised and that many Australians have in terms of the disruptive actions that appear to be being taken uh, by some regulators in China at present uh, and the risk that those disruptive actions pose in terms of the free flow of trade. I can also uh, confirm in relation to uh, uh, your primary question that my office has had engagement with uh, the Seafood Trade Advisory Group, uh, as has Assistant Minister Dunningham, uh, who has particular responsibilities in terms of the fisheries sector, uh, but is also Assistant Minister in working with me, and he has been, uh, been engaged on a very regular basis in terms of dialogue with me uh, and also with the seafood sector uh, as we seek to work through these issues with them. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question today is to the Finance Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer this afternoon to the Minister's comments during his appearance on Sky News on 8 October when he said, and I quote, As Finance Minister myself, I will be acutely aware that the quality of spending is what matters most when it comes to how we invest. Does the Minister consider a $5 million grant for small business Go Local First campaign, some of which it made its way to Liberal Party pollster Crosby Texter to be quality spending. Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Pratt. And certainly, our side of politics sees small business as being an essential part of Australia's economy. An essential part of Australia's economy in terms of the jobs they create, the innovation that occurs, indeed, the export growth that we have seen in recent years uh, from Australia. Uh, I note very much uh, in my role as Trade Minister uh, that over recent years we have seen many thousands of additional Australian small and medium-sized businesses begin to export for the first time ever, and in doing so they are generating greater wealth for our country, but also all of the evidence shows that they tend also to be businesses uh, who employ more people, who grow faster. Now, we also respect we also respect, Mr. President, the role of industry representative bodies, and I hear, I hear indeed Minister Cash talk about the important role that COSBOA plays in terms of advocacy and support for small businesses across Australia. We value engagement with them. We value working with them. We want to make sure uh, that small business in Australia has its voice heard, and that's why we've acted through this time of crisis, Mr. President. Why we've acted through this time of crisis to make sure that Australian small businesses get the support they need. It will be small business who is a key driver for Australia out of the economic challenges that we face. Those opposite seem to forget that we're in the greatest global depression that we've seen since the Great Depression, the greatest global downturn that we've seen since those times. And so, we won't apologise for getting in and supporting small business, for helping Australian small business, for helping their leadership as well in terms of ensuring that the policies that are applied across this country help them to grow, help them to create jobs, help to ensure, Mr President, that we do achieve the strongest possible recovery for all Australians. Senator Pratt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Evidence at Senate estimates confirmed that long-term Liberal mate and former Crosby Texter pollster Jim Reid received more than a million dollars in government market research contracts without even having to go to tender. So Order. I ask, who recommended Mr Reid to the Prime Minister's department? Was it the Prime Minister's office? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Order. Well, I'm sure those sorts of questions were addressed in Senate estimates and are being addressed through, uh, through questions on notice through Senate estimates. Mr President, I'm confident that proper processes in accordance with all of the guidelines will have been followed, and those details no doubt will order. be provided. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The minister was asked who recommended Mr Reid, the Crosby texter pollster, for, for this contract, which did not go to competitive tender. The fact that it was asked in estimates is not a, not a response. He is the minister representing the prime minister. We want to know whether it was the prime minister's office. I'm listening carefully. I've allowed you to remind the minister of the last part of the question. As I've said, as long as he remains directly relevant to part of the question, I can't direct him to answer another part, but I am listening carefully. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, what I was talking about there was indeed the fact that uh, there has been much scrutiny of these sorts of programs during estimates, and I have every suspicion if we go back and look, there are probably these questions that were asked, may have been taken on notice, and will have been, uh, will have been answered or will be answered on notice. Now, if they weren't and they need to be, I'll bring any details I can back to the chamber. But the Go, the Go Local First, the Go Local First campaign is about providing encouragement to consumers to shop locally, to support their local small businesses, to ensure the viability of those small businesses, to strengthen economic activity in the local economy and community. That's what this sort of program is doing, and I would have Order. thought those on that side Senator should champion Birmingham. and support it. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can, can you confirm you've taken this question on notice? Can you confirm whether any of this research or polling was provided to the Prime Minister's office or to the Liberal Party? And if so, how is it appropriate for the Prime Minister's office to fund research for the Liberal Party of Australia? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, if there's anything that, uh, that isn't being addressed already or hasn't been addressed through the Senate estimates process, then I will take that on notice and, uh, and make sure it's addressed. But what I can confirm is important is that we absolutely back Australian small businesses to drive more consumers through their doors. Order. During Senator the course Wong on a point of order. Duckan and Weaving. Direct relevance, Mr. President. Mr. President, direct relevance. How is it appropriate for the Prime Minister's office to fund research for the Liberal Party? There's no question, discussion about small business in this question. Um, on, the, on the point of order, um, there were several questions there. Um, that was the last one. You are correct to say there was nothing that referenced the portfolio policy area that you mentioned, but the minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question. I will listen carefully, and he has 43 seconds remaining. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I'd address that, uh, that if there are issues in relation to some of the elements that Senator Pratt raised, I'll bring those back to the chamber. But, Mr. President, the point I was also making is the value of ensuring that we do get more Australians through the doors of Australian small businesses to help them get back on their feet. To help them get back on their feet. You know, thousands of Australian small businesses this year were closed down. Mandatorily closed Order. down by governments Order. to help us deal with a global pandemic. To help us deal with a global pandemic. In reopening the economy, we want to make sure those small businesses who went for months without revenue, Order. without customers, without support, Order. now get Senator people Birmingham, back through their doors the so they can thrive expired. again. Senator Order. Order. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on the ways in which Australia's development program has pivoted to support our Indo-Pacific neighbours to meet the COVID challenge? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Mr. President, given that the impact of COVID-19 uh, in our region is so significant, our strong focus is on recovery. Partnerships for Recovery is targeted to health security, to stability and to economic recovery, the issues that our Pacific neighbours identify as their priorities while protecting the most vulnerable, including women and girls and people with disabilities. Partnerships for Recovery frames our response, drawing on all of our national assets to support development—diplomatic, economic and security. I think our Pacific Labor Mobility programs are a good example of the shift that we've undertaken, where we've made immigration and quarantine, development policies all work together to keep this vital program going uh, and to keep remittances flowing to the Pacific, as well as supporting the labour needs of regional and rural Australia. Mr. President, in practical terms, our immediate response to COVID-19 involved a very substantial pivot of funds within our development program to respond to the most pressing needs of our region. We immediately rolled out our Indo-Pacific Response and Recovery Package. That included the distribution of PPE, critical medical services and also the establishment of the Pacific Humanitarian Corridor to keep essential services flowing. Yeah. Essential services, yeah. essential goods, essential people to ensure they were able to move around the key areas of the Pacific. This package was our first step, 
And overall, we directed in 2019-20 over 400 of approximately 1,000 development investments to direct COVID-19 support. A huge task. And I want to commend the highly professional DFAT teams at Posts and here in Australia on their efforts in what was a very significant undertaking to urgently address COVID-19. Order, Senator Payne. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how Australia's development pivot is more than just an emergency response and will support the long-term recovery of our region. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. We know that Australia's own health, safety and security uh, and prosperity is intertwined with that of our region. And so partnerships for recovery is more than an emergency response. Uh, in fact, on the 23rd of October, Minister Hawke and I announced 27 separate and detailed COVID-19 development response plans, a detailed blueprint for a shared recovery over the next 18 months. And in addition, the government has announced two major temporary supplementary initiatives. Firstly, a $304.7 million economic recovery package in the Pacific and Timor-Leste over two years. Secondly, a commitment over $500 million for procuring and delivering safe and effective vaccines for our partners in the Pacific, Timor-Leste and Southeast Asia. This complements our $80 million contribution to the Gavi COVAX facility advanced market commitment. We know that a safe and effective vaccine will be the bedrock Order. to our shared Senator recovery. Payne. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister describe the discussions the government has had with our Pacific and Southeast Asian neighbours about partnerships for recovery? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Scar. Since the pandemic began, both the Prime Minister and I and uh, many other ministers, Minister Hawke and many colleagues, have been working very closely with partners to shape our regional responses and, of course, our own partnerships for recovery, as I mentioned. That includes numerous bilateral calls made to ministerial counterparts in the first three months of the pandemic, as well as participating virtually in really important ASEAN and Pacific Island Forum yeah. meetings taking place even in the context of COVID-19. Our neighbours, like us, of course, see the value of working in close partnership to respond to this pandemic. As Fijian Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama said recently, Australia has stepped up with solidarity to ensure Pacific economies are not left behind. Timor-Leste Prime Minister Tao Martin Ruak also issued a statement noting the Australian government and people's support and solidarity, noting also that Australia was, of course, dealing with COVID-19 issues ourselves and welcoming Order. our response. Senator Payne. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Attorney-General, Senator Payne. Minister, I'm sure you've heard of the former New South Wales Labor politician, Mr Eddie Obeid. Mr Obeid was a key player in the right faction of the ALP and a member of the state parliament for 20 years. Sadly, Mr Obeid wasn't there to serve the public interest. He was there to serve himself. He was using his inside knowledge and his connections to line up government decisions that would benefit himself and his family and raking in millions and millions of dollars in the process. Minister Obeid got caught out thanks to an anonymous tip-off to the New South Wales Anti-Corruption Commission. The tip-off sparked an inquiry, then a full investigation and public hearings about what had been going on. He's now behind bars. My question is this. If New South Wales had Mr Porter's proposed Integrity Commission instead of an ICAC with teeth, would there ever be an investigation on the actions of Eddie Obeid thanks to that tip-off? The Minister representing the Attorney-General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, um, Mr President. Um, I may be mistaken, but I understand Mr Obeid to have left um, prison uh, relatively recently. But let me uh, go to the question in relation to, of, to the Integrity Commission. Uh, just on the 2nd of November, Mr President, uh, the government released an exposure draft of the legislation to establish the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, and that is released for extensive public consultation. That draft legislation is the result of very detailed planning to ensure that this new body has both the resources and the power that it needs to investigate allegations of criminal corrupt conduct that could occur across the public sector. I want to reinforce the government's commitment to a national comprehensive consultation process on the draft legislation. 
I understand that a series of consultation sessions is being arranged for the law enforcement and public sector groups that would be regulated under the legislation, as well as roundtable meetings with civil society representatives, academia and other stakeholder representatives from all states and territories. Those sessions will be held across a consultation period that will run from, the 20th, uh, from November this year to March 2021. Mr. President, what this indicates is the government's commitment uh, to a body, as I said, that has both the resources and the power that it needs to investigate those allegations of criminal corrupt conduct that could occur across the public sector. We believe that our, our uh, commission, which is properly designed, having gone through a robust consultation phase, uh, will do the task that uh, it is required to at the Commonwealth level. It will have greater investigatory powers than a royal commission, including the ability to hold hearings and to compel witnesses to testify. It will be the lead body in Australia's multi-agency anti-corruption framework and will include a public sector integrity division and a law enforcement integrity division, Mr. President. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, the Victorian Anti-Corruption Commission is currently investigating the actions of Mr. Adam Sumarek. He was a minister in the Premier and Daniel Andrews government until he was booted out of the party over allegations of branch stacking. Branch stacking isn't illegal, but most Australians know that paying people to become members of your party so you can control who gets pre-selected is morally corrupt. If Victoria had Minister Porter's in proposed integrity commission instead of their IBAC, would we ever have had an investigation into the ac actions of Mr Somerak? Senator Payne. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Lambie for her supplementary question. Uh, and I would reiterate the, uh, the um, uh, remarks I made during uh, my first response to her, uh, her initial question. Uh, the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, uh, as I said, would uh, be the lead body in our successful multi agency anti corruption framework. Uh, the Public Sector Integrity Division is the one that will have oversight of Commonwealth departments, of agencies and their staff parliamentarians and their staff to the question about two parliamentarians uh, from Senator Lambie so far, the staff of federal judicial officers, as well as recipients of Commonwealth funds in appropriate circumstances. Uh, the structure of the Commission uh, also ensures that the courts remain the sole arbiter of a person's guilt or innocence. In terms of the Law Enforcement Integrity Division, uh, it will expand the jurisdiction of the ACLE and will have all of ACLE's existing powers and functions, including oversight of a range of agencies in that context, which I'm happy to go into Order. if Senator Lambie Senator wishes Payne. me to. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Mr President, I'll rephrase my questions. As Mr Porter's integrity, proposed integrity commission stands, would Senator Maguire uh, using his position as a member for Wagga Wagga in New, S New South Wales Liberal government to make money for himself and his association, associates. He was charging property developers a, commissioner, a commission to line up meetings with public officials and grease the wheels on government approval processes. Would the public have ever found out about his abuse of public office and his close connection to the Premier if New South Wales Order. was Senator using Lambie. Mr Porter's Time for proposed the question integrity? Has expired. Senator Payne. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I think, given the given the factors that I have uh, have been through, particularly in relation to the public sector integrity division of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, which includes the behaviour, the oversight of the behaviour of parliamentarians and their staff, as well as recipients of Commonwealth funds in appropriate circumstances, uh, that those matters would indeed, if they were. Uh, covered in the Commonwealth context, I would hasten to add that uh, it was Mr Maguire, not Senator Maguire, uh, in the Commonwealth context. Um, if that is not the case, Senator, uh, and I can provide any further information, I will take that on notice and return to the chamber. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, last week, former New South Wales Auditor General Tony Harris told the Sports Rorts Senate inquiry that, and I quote, if the minister fell on the basis of the government's failure to administer this program properly, then the prime minister's involvement would be that the prime minister and or his office was involved in maladministration, at least. Why did the Sports Rorts scandal cost Senator Mackenzie her job, but the prime minister and other senior ministers keep theirs. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I think all of those uh, issues were addressed at the time uh, by the Prime Minister uh, and indeed my predecessor in this place. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Harris told the inquiry, and I quote, "There appears to be, by design, not by accident, a drift towards reduce, reducing the scrutiny of government. I think it's a pattern of behaviour that constitutes a goal." Why is the Prime Minister reducing scrutiny across government by cutting funding to the National Audit Office? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, well I, think I seem to recall it's a sense of deja vu. It's only my second day in the job here, but, uh, but I have a sense that uh, I was asked this question yesterday and I answered this question yesterday in pointing out that funding for the Australian National Audit Office keeps going up each and every year. Uh, that, uh, that yes, as was well fleshed out, and congratulations to those opposite that at estimates they managed to flesh out that a government agency had indeed asked for more money in the budget process, hadn't got everything that it asked for. But don't go around pretending somehow that increasing funding each and every year into the forward estimates is by any means a cut. It's not. It's more money. It enables them to continue to do their job. Senator Farrell, final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have one. Uh, Mr. Harris continued to tell the inquiry that the sports fraud scandal was, and I quote, a very significant indicator that things are very poor in the state of government and would be dealt with by an effective anti-corruption commission. Why is the government deliberately dragging its feet on a national integrity commission that could investigate the misuse of taxpayers' money through scandals like sports rorts and airport Order. rorts? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, my colleague Senator Payne just did detail to uh, Senator Lambie the work that has been undertaken to, uh, to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission and the draft legislation that was released for public consultation on the 2nd of November 2020. And I look forward to Senator Farrell, no doubt, being an active participant in that public consultation process. I'm sure Senator Farrell will make a detailed, thoughtful contribution to that process. Uh, and indeed, the government has gone out for consultation because we recognise consultation on such a process is critical. Senator Farrell, you have until 12 February 2021 to make your thoughtful, detailed contribution and submission to this process, uh, and the government will then work through the next appropriate stages in terms of how it is that we deliver an appropriate Commonwealth Integrity Commission that builds upon the many avenues of scrutiny that already exist across government and the public service. This is not about starting from scratch. It's recognising that there are Order. a range Senator of different Birmingham scrutiny agencies for already in place and building expired. on Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Liberal National Government's strong budget management is delivering vital capability to our Australian Defence Force and jobs for our fellow Australians who work in the defence industry as we build a stronger economy? The Minister, the, for, the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Betts for that question, and I also thank his, him for his tireless commitment to the ADF. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, protecting our nation's security and also our nation's sovereignty are essential preconditions for our nation's prosperity. The Morrison government is investing over $270 billion in Australia's defence capability over the next decade alone. This is the biggest, the biggest investment in the ADF capability in many generations. This investment is meeting the challenge of our region's rapidly changing and also its deteriorating strategic environment. As Minister for Defence, my focus is now on ensuring defence delivers the three new strategic objectives we have set them, that is to shape, to deter and to respond. I'm particularly proud our government has restored the defence budget to 2 per cent of GDP, achieving a commitment we made in 2013. Defence and defence industry now have the certainty, the funding and also now the roadmap they need to deliver the 2024 structure plan. The defence budget is providing also an important contribution to the Australian economy and to Australian jobs. Over 15,000 companies now support defence, and that is over 70,000 Australian workers. Uh, and that number is increasing even during COVID-19 this year. So, with investments like this, 
We've got a $1 billion COVID economic recovery package supporting 4,000 Australian jobs, and our local industry capability plans are now awarding 73 per cent of infrastructure work to local businesses. Defence, through the leadership of this government, is rising to the challenge to build a stronger nation and provide an important and enduring contribution to our nation's economy. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for her comprehensive answer. Further, can the minister update the Senate on the government's delivery of our defence capability since the 2016 defence white paper? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Abetz again for that question. Since the 2016 defence white paper, this government has approved more than 400, 400 capability decisions worth over $122 billion. We are building a stronger nation by bolstering Australia's defence capability, and this is backed by real funding with a belief, an absolute belief in Australian companies and in Australian workers. The Morrison government's national security agenda unashamedly puts Australia's defence capability first for now and for the next many decades to come. And we are, unlike those opposite in government, we are getting on with the job. We are building over 70 ships in Australia. 70 ships in Australia. We are manufacturing hundreds of combat vehicles in Queensland. And as I said, we are supporting the jobs of over 70,000 Australians. Australians can trust Order. this government Senator to Reynolds, deliver at the ADF capability has we expired. need. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Finally, can the minister inform the Senate why it is important to provide certainty for our defence budget? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I certainly can. It is critically important to make sure that defence and defence industry in this nation have funding and program certainty because that allows us to back in our defence strategy with credible force. It allows us to maintain our capability edge, and it also allows us to invest in a far more resilient Australian sovereign industrial base here, right in Australia. And let us never, ever forget the legacy we inherited from those opposite in 2013. Under those opposite two white papers, they stripped out $18 billion from the defence budget and it, the defence budget was cut to the lowest level since 1938 to 1.56 per cent of GDP. They, not only did they take $18 billion out, they cut, they delayed and they cancelled 170 capabilities, deployable health, Collins sonar upgrades and Order. maritime strike Senator weapons. Reynolds, and under them, the no single submarine— Sen Sen Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Almost three years after it started work on it, two years after it committed to implementing it, and almost 12 months after the deadline it set, set itself, the Morrison government finally released its draft bill to establish a National Integrity Commission last week, blaming the delay on COVID, which hit our shores eight months ago. Why has the Morrison government been dragged kicking and screaming to legislate for a National Integrity Commission? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Brown. And, uh, and obviously, it's going to be a very good submission to the consultation process uh, because uh, Senator Farrell is going to have Senator Brown helping him uh, draft it and, uh, and contribute. Uh, the, the government, as indeed Senator Payne has outlined in question time already and as I have outlined in question time already, has published the draft legislation, opened up a consultation process, uh, and the first stage there is underway. The Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity will be given jurisdiction over four new agencies from 1 January 2021. So whilst we are going through that process of consultation about the legislation for the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, we also will ensure that the ATO, ASIC, APRA and the ACCC uh, have that oversight of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity as well. In the 2020-21 budget, we provided $9.9 million to the Commission and an additional 38 ASL to help them expand their jurisdiction over these agencies. In terms of budgeting, the Commonwealth Integrity Commission has some allocation of more than $106 million of new funding allocated to it over the forward estimates from 2019-20 
which is in addition to the funding being provided for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. In contrast to the fact that Labor had come out with design principles, we have come out with draft legislation, a detailed proposal in terms of how this will apply, how it will work and how it builds on the existing accountability and integrity measures that are in place. We want to make sure that we don't go and duplicate, that we don't reinvent, but that we do establish we do establish the type of structure that ensures we get the most out of the existing mechanisms and address any other absences or gaps that may exist. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Experts have criticised the government's draft bill, saying it is, and I quote, the weakest watchdog in the country, designed to cover up corruption, not expose it, and that and I quote, the real reason for that is that they're afraid of it and how it might affect them. Yep. End quote. What is the Morrison government so afraid of? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're not afraid of anything. We're determined to get things right. And we're determined to go through the right process in terms of how we, how we go about this and to build upon those existing infrastructure that exists in terms of the scrutiny of government at all its levels, the accountability uh, of government at all its levels. This is our determination that we do bring this forward and achieve the right balance, Mr President. The right balance between, indeed, what are sometimes criticised as star chambers in terms of the way uh, other ICAC-type structures operate, or, indeed, uh, others that are criticised in different ways. And we, what we want to ensure through this process, and what the Attorney General is carefully stepping through through his consultations with the public, is to make sure we get it right in terms of how it operates and how it operates in tandem and alongside all of those other agencies. And we look forward to the Labor Party providing its detailed submission Order, on that. Senator, Birmingham. Senator Brown, a final supplementary uh, question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Will the Morrison government guarantee the establishment of a National Integrity Commission in this term of government? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, that, of course, will depend upon the process of the legislation through this place. It is, a, it is a brave person, Mr President, who predicts how this parliament will react, particularly this chamber, particularly this chamber, Mr President. Uh, so I commit that we will do, as the Attorney General has outlined, in terms of draft legislation being out there, the consultation process being underway, the opportunity for all and sundry, including the Australian Labor Party, to make a detailed submission in that regard. For Senator Farrell and for Senator Brown and Senator Wong, if she wants to chime in as well, can all make their detailed submission to the process. And then, given it was draft legislation, we will update it following that consultation process and bring it to the parliament. And then it is, like all legislation in this place, subject to the will of the parliament. Senator Antich. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, can you please update the Senate on the progress of the Morrison government's $1 billion job trainer fund and how this program is ensuring Australia has the skilled workforce it needs for economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister has made it very clear our recovery from COVID-19 is well and truly a skills-led recovery. We need to ensure that businesses, industry, employers in Australia have the employees with the requisite skills that they need. And that is why the Morrison government is investing this year alone a record $7 billion in our vocational education and training system within Australia. And of course, this includes our job trainer skills package, but along with the wage subsidies that we're putting in place, including the boosting apprentices and trainees commencements measures, but of course also the supporting apprentices and trainees measures that we have put in place. But as part of our job trainer package, we have put in place, partnering with the states and territories, we will deliver around 340,000 additional training places to our vocational education and training system. And the key to these places, though, are that they are in areas of actual labour market need. And we have worked closely 
with the individual states and territories to determine on the ground in those states and territories what are the additional training places that they need. And I'm very pleased to inform the Senate uh, that with Victoria uh, lifting their restrictions, all states and territories are now signed up to job trainer. And in fact, training is now being delivered in South Australia, Western Australia and New South Wales. With these three states alone, what we already have coming online is an additional 200,000 training places. And Mr President, in my home state of Western Australia, the first data, it was only launched in September, 7,868 enrolments are already. Uh, people actually want to train in areas of labour Order, market Senator demand. Cash. Senator Antich, supplementary question. Minister, how does this substantial investment in new skills training build upon the, uh, the work the government has taken to support small businesses to keep apprentices in training through the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, one of the very first actions that the government took at the outset of COVID-19 was to ensure that our small businesses were able to keep their apprentices and trainees on the job in training where we need them to be. And we, of course, put in place our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. It commenced in April of this year, and uh, it runs through until March next year. As at the 5th of November. This measure alone has supported over 55,600 businesses, the majority of them being small businesses, and we are retaining over 97,900 apprentices and trainees on the job. And in fact, Mr uh, President, to date, over 20,000 bricklayers, 15,000 electricians, 10,000 plumbers, 5,000 hairdressers and 8,000 automotive mechanics have been supported through this wage subsidy. They have been kept on the job in those businesses because of the actions the Morrison Order. government took. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19, how will the government's job maker budget build on our record of skills reform and support new apprentices into training? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, in addition to the measure of the supporting apprentices and trainees uh, to keep them on the job, as a government, we understand we now need to encourage new commitments to occur to ensure that pipeline of skilled workers. And in doing that, we have now invested in a $1.2 billion boosting apprenticeships commencement wage subsidy. This will create uh, around 100,000 new training opportunities uh, for Australians across Australia. What we've done is we've said to employers of any size, in any industry, in any location in Australia, they are able to access the wage subsidy to sign up new apprentices and trainees. The wage subsidy is a substantial wage subsidy. It is 50 per cent of the apprentices' wage flowing through until the 30th of September next year. We will ensure apprentices and trainees are kept on the job, but also new apprentices and trainees come into the pipeline. Order. Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Payne and Birmingham to the questions asked by myself and Senator Pratt. Well, Madam Deputy President, in recent years there has been a serious ongoing global discussion about the experiences and mistreatment of women at work and at home. And the stories that have arisen during the course of that discussion have been shocking to many, but disappointingly familiar to many more. We know that discrimination and harassment of women at work is a problem in Australia, and it is a widespread problem. And it would be a mistake to believe that the parliament or any other workplace is immune. And I want to acknowledge the bravery of all of the women who have told their stories as part of this ongoing discussion, including the women who told their stories <coughs> last night. That cannot have been easy. 
These are important conversations that we need to have, and we need to listen. The claims of women should not be easily dismissed, as they may have been in the past. And no matter what side of politics you're from, staff members working here should feel safe and supported. But as suggested on last night's program, this may not be the experience of many working in this building. <laughs> and this parliament needs to commit to work in a bipartisan way to make this workplace better. This is a workplace that is significant to us, but it is significant to all Australians. Is it a workplace owned? It is the property of the Australian people, and we have an obligation to make it the best place it can possibly be. And yet today we saw the Prime Minister, I think precipitously, dismiss the claims that were made last night. Serious allegations have been raised by more than one party, but there was no acknowledgement from the Prime Minister in his statement today of the seriousness of these allegations or of the broader issue of sexual harassment and sexism experienced in workplaces across the country. The Prime Minister has indicated he intends to take no further action on some of the specific claims raised last night, and he suggested that these are issues of the past. Partisanship may feel comfortable to the Prime Minister and others in this building. It may feel familiar, but this is not a time for that. This is a time and an opportunity for the Prime Minister to show leadership. There is a chance to make the parliament a safer place for women to work. And I hope that the Prime Minister, <coughs> notwithstanding his comments today, will take that opportunity. It's important here in the parliament and it's important more broadly. A survey by the Human Rights Commission shows that one in three people have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the past five years. We've had a national inquiry conducted by the Human Rights Commission, which surveyed 10,000 people, consulted with 600 people directly, made 55 recommendations, and to date we do not have a response from Mr Porter to that important report. The process of responding is not straightforward, of changing culture is not straightforward, and it is true that the Australian Labor Party has been on a long journey a journey I have been privileged to be part of over the more than 20 years that I have been a member of the Labor Party. And it started, I think, in earnest and seriousness when we committed to increasing the number of women in our ranks through affirmative action. And we have worked over a long period of time to improve our culture, to build a culture which is respectful and inclusive and where complaints are handled appropriately. There is no point in time when any of us can afford to say, job done, that's concluded, that's finished. This is an ongoing project to which we all have responsibilities. And any instance where a staff member or a parliamentarian feels disrespected or is unsafe should be addressed. We want women and young people to look at our building and see a place where leaders act at their best. We want women and young people to come to this building and feel that they can contribute. And we can't pretend that a transformation will be easy. In our case, it has taken deliberate effort over time by many, but this is something that is worth doing. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Uh, I wanted to uh, echo a number of the sentiments uh, that were there in Senator McAllister's uh, contribution about absolutely uh, the need for uh, women and men uh, to feel safe uh, in the workplace, for there to be no discrimination, uh, bullying, harassment uh, or any other uh, poor behaviour of any sort from people in this place, whether they be ministers of the Crown, uh, whether they be shadow ministers, whether they be members of parliament. So, we are on a unity ticket uh, in terms of condemning uh, that kind of behaviour. In relation to uh, Minister Tudge and Minister Porter, uh, I would refer to the statements that they have issued. Uh, the Prime Minister holds the ministerial staff code of conduct and the ministerial code of conduct in the highest regard. 
and he holds to the highest standards. In fact, it's why the Prime Minister strongly supported the inclusion of a ban on relations between ministers and their staff in 2018, and the Prime Minister continues to uphold that ban. Separately, uh, in 2018, the Prime Minister directed the Liberal Party to review its complaints and disputes resolution processes. Uh, this resulted in the Liberal Party's first national code of conduct and complaints and dispute resolution policy. Um, I wanted to turn, Deputy President, to the other aspect of questioning from those opposite, and that was around quality of spend. Uh, this was what the Labor Party decided to devote much of question time to today. Uh, the Labor Party, uh, the party of pink bats, uh, the party of cash for clunkers, uh, the party of checks for dead people, uh, the Labor Party, the party uh, of school hall rorts. Uh, decided uh, that they wanted to make a point of quality spending, and they chose to use as their example and to show just how out of touch they are. Uh, they decided to compare and contrast uh, their wonderful record of spending uh, with things like the Urban Congestion Fund. Uh, the Urban Congestion Fund was one of the things they were criticising today. So the Labor Party is sitting there with their woeful record of managing the budget and managing the economy, and they come in here. And we've got Senator Ciccone, of course, a senator for Victoria, and they criticised the fact uh, that there were a lot of urban congestion fund projects. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, projects. Senator Seselja. Please take your seat. Um, senator Keneally. I just call to your attention that Senator Seselja is reflecting on who is in the chamber and who is not, when in this case who is. He's not meant to do that in the course of debate. Thank you. Um, senator Seselja, I do remind you that the president did um, make particular note that during COVID time and this week, given that we are still operating on remote participation, it wouldn't be appropriate to um, make note of who's in the chamber or, or who is the, uh, the president made that statement some time ago. Through to you, Thanks. Deputy President. Senators for Victoria, like uh, Senator Ciccone and others, would be highly embarrassed uh, by the line of attack from the Labor Party today, where, in comparing and contrasting uh, their woeful record of spending, they decided to go after the Urban Congestion Fund and the fact that Melbourne, uh, which up until COVID, of course, was growing very rapidly, uh, had significant investment from the Commonwealth Government in helping people to get to and from work more quickly and more safely. So the modern Labor Party uh, decides that that is their line of attack, or support for small business is their line of attack, or environmental remediation on the Great Barrier Reef is their line of attack, and they invite us to compare and contrast. And we do, we do today. Deputy President, compare and contrast because of the critique that is coming of the Labor Party from the member for Hunter. You know, the member for Hunter has very much spelled the cat on what the modern Labor Party stands for. You know, I, I would put this to senators today. If there is not room in the Labor Party front bench for, some, for people like the member for Hunter, Mr Fitzgibbon, then that is a message to millions of Australians that there is no room in the modern Labor Party for them, for, people, for working people in our regions, for people in the Hunter, for people in central and north Queensland, for people in northern Tasmania, in regional Victoria. These are the people who the Labor Party, by forcing the Minister for Hunter out of his front bench position today, have sent a message to. And they have sent a message saying, you're not welcome. We no longer stand for you. That, that is what Mr Fitzgibbon is effectively saying today. And the Leader of the Opposition, each way Albo as he's known, but the Leader of the Opposition will refer to him in here, is constantly changing tack. You know, he's pro-gas uh, when he's in the Hunter, or he's pro-coal when he's in central Queensland, but he goes back into Grainler or he goes into central Melbourne and suddenly he's anti those things. He's trying to be all things to all people. I mean, this week we saw the embarrassing thing where he, he, he wanted the Prime Minister to call President Trump and then he said, no, 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 I didn't say he should call him. I mean, they are embarrassed over that side. They're embarrassed at what the opposition leader is doing, but they are more embarrassed and the member for Hunter is more embarrassed embarrassed at what the modern Labor Party stands for. And if people like Mr Fitzgibbon aren't welcome in the modern Labor Party on the front bench, then millions of Australians aren't welcome in the Labor thank Party you, either. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, rise to contribute to this debate as a 
senator who lives in regional Queensland and is very proud to be a member of the Labor Party, very proud to be contributing to this debate today. Uh, I rise to take note of Senator Gallagher's question to Senator Birmingham in regard to the quality of government spending. But before I do, can I associate myself um, entirely? Senator Green, the taking note is um, Senator McAllister's. Beg your pardon, it's two pain in Birmingham. My mistake. Sorry. Yep. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before I continue, can I associate myself entirely with the remarks of Senator McAllister uh, and thank the women in this place, in, in Parliament, for their leadership? Every Every woman should feel safe at work, even if your workplace is a place of power and powerful people. And I thank Senator McAllister for her contribution today. Senator Gallagher's question uh, around quality spending raised many concerns that people in regional Queensland have shared with me about the deliberate spending of this government to prop up their own political interests, their own political interests rather than the national interests. Senator Gallagher's question raised important, important issues about some of the scandals that we have seen from this government, because we know that the sports rot scandal was not just a one-off, but reflective of a pattern of rotting behaviour we know that back in April 2018, the then Turnbull government awarded a $444 million grant to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. This was the single largest environmental grant in Australia's history, and it was awarded to a small charity with only six full-time staff. Only six full-time staff. And instead of going through a competitive tender process, to decide how this money could be spent. It is clear that it was a captain's pick, a decision made for political purposes instead of the national interest. The Auditor General found that the department had failed to properly follow, properly follow government rules around making the grant. There was no clear, specific or targeted objectives for the funding, but instead just broad and general guidelines. For $44 million, $444 million grant, and there are no guidelines on how this government requires that money to be spending. And I know because we've sat in Senate estimates with the Environment Department and asked them questions about how this money is being spent. But unfortunately, we can't call members of the Foundation to Senate estimates to ask them how this money is being spent and if it is indeed helping the Great Barrier Reef and the people in regional Queensland that rely on jobs supported by the Great Barrier Reef, we don't know because the government appointed this money to a foundation outside of the rules of government spending. The government argued at the time that the foundation would leverage the funds to attract further investment in reef restoration from the private sector, but they have failed on that target. So all of the justification, all the reasons for making this grant don't stack up. And it's the same when it comes to the Urban Congestion Fund. An analysis by Labor shows that 83 per cent of the $3 billion program went to government or marginal Labor seats so they could win them, so they could further their political interests. The funds were not allocated, again, through a competitive grants pro process. 28 per cent of the national funding went to four marginal Liberal seats—28 per cent. That the Audit Office has commenced an audit into the administration of the commuter car, car parks project within the Urban Congestion Fund. We look forward to receiving that report. But whether it's Sports Rorts or the Great Barrier Reef Fund or the Urban Congestion Fund, what we know is that when it comes to this government, what we always get is dismissing these concerns, an inherent belief and an entitlement that they are entitled to spend these taxpayer funds however they choose and whoever they want to give it to, no matter governance or merit, whether it's in the national interest or not. Money for mates, jobs for mates, 
grants for votes. That is not quality government spending. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to respond uh, and take note of, of the questions that were offered by or given by Labor on the other side. And, and they went to the, the issue of spending. And I'm very proud to actually stand here today and, and speak of the government's response, particularly during this year and dealing with the coronavirus challenge and the, the, the spending commitments that we have made to assist Australians in getting through the, the, the recession that was created by the coronavirus pandemic. We've seen the impact of uh, programs like JobKeeper and how that came at the most appropriate time, at the immediate time that it was needed, at the time that it was when, when businesses were worried about what they would be able to do with their staff and they know what impact it would have to their business if they were let people go, uh, and, and then when trying to recover, not having that workforce uh, with them that can help them build for their future, they, they, were, they were very, very concerned about what that would mean. Uh, in not only dealing with the immediate issue, but also importantly in how they would recover on the other side of that. And the, the job, uh, job keeper program has enabled uh, many, many, many uh, millions of Australians right across Australia to be able to remain connected with their employer. Now we've heard questions today about uh, what about, about a program that's been there to support local businesses. Now this program. Uh, really struck a chord with Australians because, you know, particularly when we're in the in the real real peak of uh, the the pandemic, when when businesses were, were were needing to shut, when people were being told to stay at home, Australians were looking for ways that they could uh, be able to support each other, the way that they could support their local businesses, their local shops. Now, I've spoken to many people across Australia that. Uh, uh, many uh, across Western Australia, my great home state, that were uh, you know, tradespeople that have actually seen their business go even better than it's been before. Now that's remarkable. That is remarkable. And and uh, and uh, West Australians have looked for opportunities to be able to. Uh, uh, take up uh, opportunity to be able to do renovations on their home. Uh, I've got a, a good friend of mine, one of my best friends that I went to school with. He's a, he's a plumber, and his business is going better than it's ever been before. He says they're, they're, the people are doing renovations on their home. They're they're taking the opportunity while they uh, to, to to do work on their home. Now this this came about because of a, of an attitude and a commitment of Australians and of West Australians in particular, my great home state. To, to want to look for opportunities to invest locally, to purchase locally, to support local business. And so, of course, this program that's, that went uh, to the, the Go Local Force uh, first, uh, run by the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia, COSBOA, uh, went to the very heart of that uh, initiative. It, it tapped into the very spirit of what Australians were looking for, and it gave that has given uh, Australians the, the opportunity to see where they can connect uh, their dollars with local opportunities, to invest in the local businesses by, by, by using their purchasing power to make decisions to support local businesses. And this has happened because this government supports initiatives like this because we support business. We support local business and we support the intelligence of Australians to be able to know where to direct their funding, to be able to know where to direct their uh, wages that they receive. And why is that? Because we as a government know that the best people, the best people, the best ones in Australia to spend their money is their own selves. It's their own selves. And that's why we've brought in tax cuts. That's why we're providing more of what, so that people can earn, uh, keep more of the money that they earn. That is, that is why these people are able to take advantage of these options. The support that's been given by this government is because we started at the beginning of this coronavirus pandemic and this challenge from a strong position. This government uh, was working from a position of economic strength, of record employment. And we're able to take action because we've worked hard in the past to bring the budget back into balance and maintain our AAA credit rating. That's why our spending is prudent. That's why our spending has been sensible. And that's why our spending has been able to target and hit the mark with Australians. 
hit the mark with businesses in ensuring that the opportunities are going to where they are most needed to support those that need it the most. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. And, uh, I was also rise today to um, take note of the answers provided uh, by the Leader of the Government. I um, also just wanted to echo and uh, support um, uh, the contribution by my colleague, uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, for us uh, um, individuals and, and people who uh, are leaders for our community in this place, that we do set an example, um, whether um, you know, people have been here for a very long time, or in my case, a very short period. But we all aspire to make sure that we provide the right example to future leaders, to future women in particular, to see that this place is representative um, of everyone, regardless of race, of their gender. And for us, we do need to stand up and say, "Enough is enough." Uh, it does get to a stage in life where. Um, you have to start to think, I guess, about the actions that one does take, and your colleagues as well, and call in and out for what it is. Uh, after all, you know, we can't afford to walk past standards and say, well, you know, do we believe that they're acceptable or not? After all, we are community leaders and we are elected in this place by our peers, and we have to do the right thing. But today I do want, also want to take the opportunity uh, to place on the record uh, my I guess, thoughts about the answers that we heard today from the, from the government uh, that Senator um, uh, Gallagher had asked uh, Senator Birmingham and, and the coalition talking about how great economic managers that they are. But all we seem to hear is always a headline and no substance behind that. All this great talk about the millions and billions of dollars that they're going to spend and yet, when we dig deep, as we did through Senate estimates only recently, that there's no detail. One does need to ask, is this all about good photo opportunities? Do they just like to stand up for the cameras and get that front page? Not delivering, not following up for the Australian people. The budget has racked up close to a trillion dollars of debt. But that doesn't seem to inspire me or my colleagues that there is a bold plan for jobs. The jobs that many Australians need right now, especially in my home state of Victoria. A trillion dollars of debt and we're still ex expecting close to 200,000 people to be joined in the jobless queues by Christmas. 200,000 people. Do you know how many families won't be able to put food around the table or will be having the discussion, that very hard discussion about how are we are going to pay our mortgage repayments, our bills. The cost of living does not seem to be on the radar of this government, especially where I am in my electorate in, in Chisholm. You know, this is the heartland, supposedly the Liberal Party heartland, and yet I have a lot of people calling my office every day, struggling to understand how the government have left them behind. And I'd invite the government to come down to my electro, uh, the electoral chism down there and talk to the small business operators that I regularly talk to. You know, they've got their BAS statements that are, are due, and yet they've had no or very little support from the government's uh, recent budget in terms of trying to help get their business up and going again. But that hasn't stopped this government from, I guess, neglecting the many millions of people in, in Victoria. And as we heard today in question time, um, and it was quoted, that the leader of the government in this place was acutely aware that the quality of government spending is what matters when it comes to how we invest. And I guess all I can say is how. How is it that he and his government can defend a decision to spend 83% of the uh, $3 billion allocated under the Urban Congestion Fund in Liberal-held seats. Are Liberal-held seats deserving better quality roads than Labor-held seats or any other seats held by independents or other minor parties? Are Liberal-held seats worth 83 per cent more? These are the questions that really do need to be asked. 
And when you do look dig deep, the voters in Dunkley have questions about the quality of these investments, as do the voters in Scullin and Hotham and in Bruce. And time and time again, this is the rhetoric that we seem to hear from the coalition government. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I, I rise to take note of the answers given by Minister Payne relating to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Perhaps Minister Porter would like us to believe that federal politicians are more saint-like than their state counterparts. I doubt it. Maybe he thinks that he can pull the wool over our eyes and insist that you all up here don't need someone to watch over the people in this place and make sure you're doing all the right things. Maybe he thinks he can convince us that the Commonwealth Government doesn't really need a strong cop on the beat. That's the only explanation I can see for the way he's designed his Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Compared to how we treat corruption in the states and territories, his commission isn't a watchdog, it's a mouse. It won't have the scope, the power or the capability to look into some of the worst corruption problems we've seen this year alone. Take Adam Sumerick. You might remember him. Mr Sumerick was a minister in Dan Andrews' government in Victoria. He was a factional power broker with the membership numbers behind him to control which candidates would get pre-selected to run at an election. It turns out he wasn't pulling tons of members because he had a convincing sales pitch. He was faking it. He was forging signatures on sign-up forms and paying people to let him put them down on the books. He got caught logging folders full of $50 notes through a Red Rooster parking lot and handing it over to a staff member of another minister's office to organise for more sign-ups. Very uncouth. What he wasn't doing wasn't criminal. It isn't illegal, but that shouldn't matter. Australians can tell you it is morally, politically corrupt. It is wrong. It is misuse of public office. Australians get that. The experts get it. The Victorian IBAC gets it too. That's why they're running an investigation on what he's done. But somehow, Minister Porter and the LNP don't get that. If Victoria had his version of an integrity commission, Adam Sumerak wouldn't be wouldn't be under investigation right now. He wouldn't have to face the Australian public and explain why he did why he did what he did. The Commissioner would have no power at all to go in and take a look at what's been going on in the Labor Party because it can only examine the actions if they're pretty sure a criminal offence may have been committed. Take another example. Daryl Maguire. This is a recent one. Mr Maguire used his position as a member for Wagga Wagga in New South Wales Liberal government to make money for himself and his associates. He was lining up meetings with decision makers in government for his clients and charging them for the privilege. When his clients got a good result thanks to the meetings Mr Maguire set up, he'd get a payout. Thanks to the public hearings run by the New South Wales Anti-Corruption Commission, we know that the Premier knew about it too. Not so angelic as she'd like to be. When he told her that he was set to make five grand out of a multi-million dollar property deal that he'd helped set up using his government contacts, she texted him back, hey, congrats, great news, woohoo, woohoo. It's important for the Australian people to find out when these things are going on. And Minister, Minister Porter's proposal wouldn't do that. It keeps everything behind closed doors. What's new? Cover-ups. We'd never have found out what was going on in New South Wales if we had his model down there. All of us here should want to prove to voters that politicians who misuse their office for their own game will get found out, and so they should. And voters should know that shoddy behaviour, shoddy immoral behaviour, will be and should be punished. Minister Porter's model does not do that. His model ties the commissioner's hands. They couldn't look into sports rorts and they couldn't look into the Leppington Airport sale. You can give a commission like that all the powers in the world, the powers of a royal commission or more, but it won't mean squat if they're never able to get started on an investigation in the first place and the public will never hear about it anyway. Minister Porter's proposal, as it stands, won't do anything to convince Australians that corrupt politicians will get caught in its current form. It is worth nothing, absolutely nothing at all. And I think we've got to be honest here, we'd be better off having nothing at all than the crap that Porter is putting in front of us. It does not build trust. 
does not build trust in the, in, back in the eyes of the Australian people. They might as well just call it a policy of cover-up, because that is all it is going to present with itself. This is not what the Australian people have asked for. This is not what they want. And if you have nothing to hide, if you have nothing to hide, then let's get serious about this. Let's get an ICAC in place that actually does something and holds us responsible for our actions up here. Because I can tell you now, it is not on and is unsatisfactory with what is going on up here. And if you think that's acceptable, really honestly, you need to go back and have a good moral look at yourselves. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie, um, I'm not going to ask you to withdraw that phrase, but I am going to ask you to re reflect on your language and not use such unsavoury terms in the future. It's not quite parliamentary, um, but I'll um, let, let it lie for the moment. Um, 